The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anuj Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis and psychedelics industries by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. <laughs> You'll notice the slightly different title. We're talking about psychedelics today, so more on that in a bit. I hope you're all well and had a good Easter break. I just got back from a lovely family holiday in Fuerteventura in the Canary Islands, which is a gorgeous and very windy place. But after that, I managed to escape my family and I went to CB Expo in Zurich in Switzerland at the end of last week, which I'd obviously been mentioning a few times on the previous shows. This was genuinely a really great event. I really, really enjoyed it. It was great speakers and panels, a really nice amount of people. Don't ask me to guess, but I'll say 200 to 300 people. And I really enjoyed the more intimate venue and, and I managed to meet loads of people. So huge congrats to Ben Arn who organised and all the people that helped him. I really enjoyed the event and I highly recommend it to anyone else who's up for something like that. I really generally liked what they're doing in Switzerland. I met some really smart businesses and, and really interesting ones. So I expect a few episodes from the Swiss coming up in the next couple of months. Also a small personal milestone for me. The Cannabis Conversation page on LinkedIn passed 20,000 followers last week. It's been really lovely to see this grow over the years. And I think it's the largest cannabis following in Europe on LinkedIn. So I know no idea what that actually means in reality, but it must be a good thing, I suppose. I actually posted an article about cannabis and Parkinson's from the Michael J. Fox Foundation the other day, and it it's got nearly 1,000 likes. I guess everybody loves Marty McFly. Anyway, thank you all for your continued support. It's, uh, it's really nice to, to achieve these sort of things. So this week, as mentioned, is a show about psychedelics. And this is the second panel show I'm doing as part of the podcast. I've been wanting to follow up on the one I did about Germany and um, legalization in Germany in December, but it's taken me a bit of a while. There's a lot of crossover between cannabis and psychedelics for obvious reasons, a lot of the same people as well. And I see a lot of what's happened in cannabis being repeated in psychedelics. So I just wanted to try and understand a bit more about what's happening, and I hope you all find it useful. Cool. On with the show. Enjoy. Hope you're all well. Today is another special episode. Uh, I really enjoyed doing the panel discussion at the end of last year on German cannabis legalization. So I thought I'd do another. Uh, this time we're talking about psychedelics. Despite the title of the podcast, there are lots of people who are active in cannabis who are also taking an interest in psychedelics, and I am one of them. On a personal level, I'm hugely excited by the therapeutic potential of psychedelics. Much like cannabis, they've been a victim of the failed war on drugs, and I'm very glad that they are now being looked at in a different light, one that can potentially help a lot of people who are suffering. However, I also see the corporatization and investment hype surrounding this emerging space, and I want to find out what's real and what's bullshit. So I've gathered some much wiser heads than me to discuss what's happening, what there is to be excited by, and what is excessive hype. Joining me today are former guest Jaspreet Grewal from Node Group, who are a life sciences clinical research organization. Mitchell Ozak, who's an independent industry consultant to cannabis and psychedelics companies, and Dr. Steve Hadjoff, who is a scientific advisor to cannabis and psychedelics companies. All of these guys sit, sit on various boards of psychedelic companies as well as cannabis companies. So they've got a really great view of what's going on. Guys, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Pleasure to be here. Great to be here. Good to be here. Cool. Well, there's lots, lots and lots to go through, actually. So to kick off, would you mind briefly introducing yourselves before we get stuck in? Jaspreet, would you like to start? Sounds good. And thanks so much for having me again. So as Anuj mentioned, I am the co-founder and CEO of Node Group, which is a uh, life sciences clinical research organization and hybrid consultancy. So we focus on assisting companies, early biotech and emerging biotech companies, navigate the path of clinical trials and commercialization in difficult areas, including cannabis and psychedelics. We currently operate in about nine different countries with different projects and are very excited about this particular emerging area. Fantastic. Thank you, Jaspreet. Steve, would you like to go next? 
Sure. So I've been a chief medical officer of, I don't know how many businesses, several businesses ranging from kitchen table startups to multi-billion dollar multinationals. So my role is generally to provide uh, clinical advice and guidance, but I've also sat on several main boards and been involved in the risk and financial planning within a business as well. And I used to be chairman of the British Medical Association. Fantastic. Thank you, Steve. And last but not least, Mitchell, would you like to introduce yourself? I'd be privileged. And I always hate following very talented people like Steve because I come across as just the dumb Canadian, but I am here. So it is a privilege and an honor to come back on this podcast, Anuj. I loved the last one and I learned a heck of a lot from being an industry participant. I'm a independent consultant and board member both in the psychedelics and cannabis industry. I, I'm based in Toronto, Canada. I've worked with over 200 companies, legal companies, developing their strategy, their organizational scale out, as well as working with them on raising money and dealing with capital market challenges and so on and so forth. So I know where a lot of the bodies are buried, but I also know where there's a lot of success stories and, and extremely talented management teams that are doing unbelievable things in psychedelics right now. Fantastic. What a stellar lineup. I am humbled to be in your presence, my friends. Thank you for joining me. And a really good spread, actually, of different angles that you're coming from. So I'm really looking forward to this. So to set the scene, let's begin. I mean, obviously, psychedelic medicine is is not a new area. It's been around for many thousands of years in many indigenous cultures. And modern psychedelic compounds have been more formally studied you know, from as early as the 40s and 50s, perhaps even earlier, for a variety of mental health conditions. But where are we at now? Jaspreet, maybe you can kick us off and give us a brief overview of some of the main drugs that are being studied and what are the types of conditions that they're being studied for? Certainly. So ketamine, esketamine is where I'll certainly start here. And it's used in primarily in the area of depression. It's sort of the first drug, if you will, of interest for the past decade. And now there's a transition to focus on other psychedelic compounds. Worth noting, ketamine is actually standard of care in a lot of jurisdictions. So for example, in Australia, it is considered first line therapy and second or tertiary therapy in a number of different countries as well. In terms of other areas or other compounds, MDMA for PTSD, which is referenced by the recent MAP study, which is being conducted by Dr. Rachel Yehuda at Mount Sinai in New York City. Psilocybin for depression, specifically treatment resistant uh, and anxiety disorders, substance abuse and addiction or other areas of research, as well as other psychiatric conditions like eating disorders. And we do have some clinical trials specific to eating disorders uh, using uh, psilocybin occurring in Australia and the United States right now. And there are other areas coming up down the pipeline. So synthetic uses are manipulations or formulations, not manipulations, but formulations of ayahuasca uh, is coming up. Ibogaine, of course, is there too, DMT. But I would say the front runners are certainly ketamine, MDMA, and psilocybin. Fantastic. Thank you. And that was quite a big question. We could have gone into a bit more detail on lots of those things, but there's loads to get through. So thank you for that, Jazz. Steve, in layman's terms, and also maybe you can highlight how different some of these things are, but in layman's terms, how do these psychedelics work on the brain and body and how may they be better than current treatments? Sure. Now, In the brain, there are sort of signaling chemicals that we call neurotransmitters. So it's not all electrics going down wires, if you like. Sometimes it's chemicals sending a signal across. And those neurotransmitters have what's called receptors. So it's something that it attaches to, to create that sensation or that thought. One of these types of receptors is called the uh, the serotonin 2A receptor. Serotonin is also called called 5-HT. Some listeners may have heard it called that. And the psychedelic drugs bind to that receptor and they stimulate it. Now that can do all sorts of things. What we see happen overall in the brain and in local areas of the brain when that happens is, now I don't know how to describe this, there's a sort of a rhythm to the brain. There's a sort of a pulsing that goes on within the brain. It's like an audience clapping along with a musician. And when the psychedelic drugs interact with those receptors, that rhythm is lost. The signals become much more random and it isn't pulsatile in that way. Now, one of the thoughts or one of the the reasons why they might be, why psychedelic drugs may be of benefit 
in treatment is what happens if the rhythm is out of whack? The rhythm is actually an unhealthy rhythm. What happens if the audience is clapping too fast for the musician to play? The musician is going to start playing bum notes. They're going to start falling behind. Now, by, in effect, setting an environment where that rhythm is gone, where it's just sort of random noise, and then bringing in psychological interventions like psychotherapy to help rebuild that framework, to help rebuild that rhythm, you can make an environment, the audience is, is clapping in the right way, and the musician can then play. So that's the sort of whistle-stop tour of what happens in the brain and why it's important potentially in the treatment of mental ill health. But psychedelics can have effects elsewhere in the body, and not all of those are positive. You know, there is some evidence around psychedelics increasing joint pain, for example, and maybe even driving joint inflammation. They affect uh, the secretion of some hormones, which potentially could have a, an effect increasing blood pressure over time and they have other effects on on the heart and on uh, blood vessels uh, elsewhere so like all other sort of medical substances there's the sort of desired effect but then there's also effects on other parts of the body yeah fantastic really good way to explain it thank you steve and i think you know it's good that you sort of brought up the fact that all of the effects are not kind of fully known yet in terms of how you make this into a natural therapeutic and how you manage the side effects, if you like, the unwanted effects. So Mitchell, moving over to sort of more industry business perspectives on this, with that overview in mind, what types of businesses that you're seeing that are springing up? It's very early on. And and as the token Canadian here, I have to make obviously a hockey reference or I wouldn't be true to my nation, but we're literally in the first period of this game. And what we're beginning to see is the emergence of different business models some of them overlapping because of companies pursuing different strategies. But essentially, the different business models, as I see it, are biotech and research and compounds, as, as Jasbri can probably talk a lot more to, psychedelics as a service, where you go in and, and you essentially get a, a guided tour through psychotherapy with psychedelic-assisted compounds. We technology services that support that. So that could be the manufacture and extraction of psilocybin, for example, and digital technology that enable psychedelics. So that could be tracking the psychedelic experience through an app that you're going through and so on and so forth. So all of those different business models and different categories within the broad psychedelics industry are very early on. They're virtually all early stage. So they're they're sucking up a lot of seed capital and series A capital to do it. There are many companies that overlap those different four pillars, rightly or wrongly. And it's not clear right now where the money is going to be made and how the industry is going to shake out. And this shouldn't be a surprise because, you know, as Jasbri talked about and, and as Stephen acknowledged, we don't know is everything we need to know yet. And we certainly don't know where the money is going to be made. So, you know, early stages, companies trying to figure it out. It'll be interesting to see how it evolves. But certainly, um, it's a very fickle industry. And money is shifting very quickly from one of those pillars to the other. Thank you. And yes, absolutely. It's early. And also, you're not the only token uh, Canadian. Jesper is here representing oh, Calgary. So. <laughs> so, yeah, a good transatlantic Mash up here <laughs> going on. So, Jazz, let's get back to the sort of science side of things. What stage are we at in terms of R&D in general? You know, these drugs have been around recreationally for quite a while, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's been huge amounts of research. Where, where are we in that sort of timeline? And out of that, what are drugs that are looking most promising? I think you mentioned that MDMA is one of the front runners. Exactly. So most publicly known is MDMA and the MAPS phase three clinical trial. So there are also promising results coming out of the Mount Sinai study, which was recently published in the center, well, recently conducted through the Center of Psychedelic Psychotherapy and Trauma Research at Mount Sinai. And of course it is phase three. So that is the furthest clinical trial we have along for any of these compounds. Uh, With psilocybin, there's an absolute boom in biotech and pharma research in this particular area. There is a good body of clinical research from Roland Griffith's team at John Hopkins and ICL, Imperial College, 
Clinical data is very promising and all signs point to psilocybin as a long lasting antidepressant. There is a lot of preclinical work currently focusing on elucidating the molecule and cellular mechanisms that give rise to the antidepressant effects. And there's certainly a lot of really good papers coming out, especially one from Alex Kwan at Yale, showing that psilocybin promotes a lot plasticity in the prefrontal cortex. And what this means for like research and R&D going forward, and as a, a CRO ourselves, we support more the commercial side of clinical trials, but we certainly require the input from the academic centers to kind of lay the, the foundation and the seed of where research goes next. I can't speak specifically to the clients we're, we're working with, but we're certainly engaged in uh, both preclinical PK phase one and phase two clinical trials using psychedelics in a number of different countries. So research is moving forward, which is very exciting. And I'm pretty sure that'll lead into your question for Steve coming up next. <laughs> yeah, that is. Thank you, Jazz. And we'll actually, we'll dig in a bit more about psilocybin and MDMA in a little bit. Steve, you mentioned earlier that, you know, in your in your wonderful analogy of how um, psychedelics work, that effectively once those sort of the rhythm is sort of dropped so that you can then have a type of intervention that intervention give me things like psychotherapy how important is the therapy part of psychedelic assisted therapy that's a, a really good question and whilst i don't think the world has a definitive answer yet i certainly have quite a strong view that it's crucial we know that uh, psychological therapies are effective they're probably the most effective interventions that we have in mental ill health. They're just not always good enough. And in my view, the psychedelic drugs are a facilitatory technology, increasing the effectiveness of the psychological therapy. If you go back to the analogy about the applause and the, uh, and the musician, in effect, what happens is once the psychedelic drug has taken that pacemaker, that beat away from the brain, that, that audience is no longer uh, trying to keep time that's the wrong time, then the psychological therapy comes in as a metronome. And that metronome shows the audience how to clap on beat so that the musician can then comfortably play the way, you know, in the most beautiful way that they, they can. And I'm not convinced that psychedelic therapy alone will achieve that much of the time. I think for some people, just breaking an aberrant cycle and letting a, a cycle reestablish may be enough. But for others, they'll just relapse into their old aberrant cycle that will be their remembered behavior pattern. And we see this with other mental health medications. They are seldom curative. I used to, when I was treating people with depression in the past, I always used to say, now, I think that some antidepressants might be beneficial for you in order to help your mood get out of your way so you can do the work on your mind that will help you to cope in the future. And it was like the SSRIs, the antidepressants, were only there as a crutch in the meaning, meaningful sense of the word so that your broken leg could heal. But meanwhile, you had to do all your physiotherapy, etc., so that you could walk again. And I don't see any evidence that psychedelic drugs are any different from those other classes of medication. Good psychological therapies are key, but they need to be good. They need to be structured therapies that actually help people sort of rebuild or build new strength rather than disappear down a rabbit hole of their own unhealthy ideas, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's definitely a thing in Western medicine that everyone wants to just have a pill that will solve all their problems. But actually, is it particularly with deep mental health issues, there's a lot of work that needs to go into it and, and the whole wraparound bit. And so Mitchell, from a business perspective, and this is something I've always been trying to grapple with. And one of the reasons that I decided to get you guys on here. I mean, the therapy part seems quite crucial to the whole package. To add a layer onto that as well, there are significant safeguarding issues with patients when they're under these drugs and there've been a number of cases where bad things have happened. So understandably, th this is something that from a safety perspective that you want to maintain for all patients. So I'm assuming that it probably involves at least two to three trained staff there during these sessions. With that in mind, do you think these things are scalable in that case, in the way that a lot of investment cases are built, if you need to have a long session and it needs two or three skilled people there? 
God, I wish you would have asked me the brain science question because that would be easier, <laughs> easier for this dumb MBA to answer. <laughs> and I couldn't have done it the justice that Steve did. It is a $64,000 question. And depending on the day you ask, I might give you a different answer. So is it scalable in that you can make pharma type of profits, say on a typical compound that go to market? I doubt it. But there's a whole industry of occupational health, a variety of different labor intensive, labor as an expert intensive kinds of industries where you provide medical services and they're very profitable. They're just not a multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical company. So the, ad, the short answer is we don't know yet because we're still in the first period of this hockey game. Having said that, the ability to deliver through telehealth services that support you know, psychedelic drugs, the ability to do a lot of things that we couldn't have done pre-COVID is reducing the overall cost structure for this business. And potentially, it's early to say, because we don't know how long each session is. We don't know the cost of each one of these psychotherapists. We don't know whether we should be in a extremely fancy clinic like Field Trip is doing or whether you can do it in a very utilitarian place. We don't know any of those things yet, but there is the possibility for a hybrid type of models that leverage the latest in, in technology as well as you know hopefully some sort of templated services and standardized compounds, which will potentially enable that. The reality is we won't know that until we get all the clinical research, we get all the FDA approvals, and so on and so forth. And that will take years. So what was interesting is when the industry was just launched, it was launched primarily, from what I saw, behind a clinic model. And that was the field trips and so on. And, and Jazz talked about that. And then it swung way farther to the other end, which was all biotech-based and compound-based. And now, thanks to people like Steve and Jazz Breed, it's starting to swing back. And COVID gave, you know, obviously a big impetus to telehealth and so on and so forth. But the reality is we're not quite there yet. And if I had to bet and ultimately answer your question after five minutes of musing, I think we're going to see a variety of different business models around this. Yeah, I think that's really useful to mention that some of the modern technology that is it wasn't really actually even that modern, but we rediscovered it due to COVID may help with the other aspects of things. Because again, to my understanding, a very important part of psychedelic assisted therapy is the integration piece after you've had the session. And obviously the ability to deliver that remotely would be a significant benefit in terms of making it widely available. Jazz, you had a, a point here. Actually, let Steve go first, because I think I know what he's going to say. <laughs> <laughs> you're too you're too kind yeah i mean it was i think what, what matrice said is all absolutely right but it was just one additional piece of context that i wanted to share if we're looking at mental ill health we're looking at one in eight one in nine people in the general population those numbers are massive so even if it's not you know the blockbuster thousand dollar a dose drug Actually, the size of the market means that there is a significant business opportunity, potentially, if you get it right. Was that what you were going to say, Jess? I was actually going to speak to the psychotherapy business model structure, which ties into this a little bit too. You certainly have that structure and model. You know that there's a, a potential, a market potential for this. But when we think about it very pragmatically from we're introducing a drug to market, we're going through the rigors of clinical trials. But as we see with all pharma, when a drug comes to market, it still goes through reimbursement modeling. So we need to know how much is it going to cost a patient. So if you outprice your product, you will not have it accessible to the market or to the people that you hope to help. So that's one key consideration for companies early on. The second is very much so the psychotherapy component. With any novel drug or drug that comes to market, the board or the regional authority that approves the drug also basically based on the label approves who is able to prescribe it or who is mandated to also be there in the room. So for example, with psychotherapists right now, the model is to have two psychotherapists in the room, but what will their training have to be? So if we're looking at uh, psilocybin or MDMA or the sort of the pharma level equivalent when it goes through the pipeline and gets a new name and has a label indication of how it's supposed to be used and, you know, the regional authority, like we have the Physicians Association, so the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Canada, 
they're going to say, okay, that's great, except you need a psychiatrist with a training in psychotherapy and a second psychotherapist could be a psychologist or it could be a mental health professional, again, jurisdictionally, depending on how they define it. But that in itself is a cost to the system too, to have two professionals, as you said, Mitchell too, right? That labor intensive expertise. But it's also going to kind of define how many people in the training programs that exist right now. With every new drug that comes to market, it will define who's allowed to prescribe it and who's going to be in the room. So I know there's a lot of people who are very excited about psychotherapy training, but we need to be cognizant of what the market will eventually dictate between sort of that wellness side of the use of psychedelics and that purely pharmaceutical and medical or clinical standpoint. You will still be bound, depending on where you build your clinic, by what the local authorities will allow you to do. And I think it's something that companies need to keep in mind because I think scaling will be an issue will we have enough psychotherapists, trained psychotherapists based on the jurisdiction to deliver that model of care? Yeah, I mean, that was definitely one of the challenges that I saw in terms of, I guess there's an element of retraining people who are currently in that field. And then there's the issue of bringing on new people too, all to be discovered, obviously. So if we just sort of go back and and dip in a bit in more detail, Steve, would you mind just talking a bit around So, I mean, I've read some fantastically glowing reports of MDMA's effectiveness for PTSD. Is that use case being shown to be one of the strongest in the field? Yeah, I mean, as every other time, I'm going to say it's too early to tell, but it looks extremely encouraging, but not entirely unexpected in some ways. I mean, it's over 100 years ago when MDMA was first synthesized by Merck, and some of the early research was around its use in a technique called abreaction. Now, abreaction is something that went out of fashion in the 1980s, or maybe a bit bit earlier, but it was basically giving a mind-altering pharmaceutical to people and giving them psychotherapy whilst under the influence of that pharmaceutical. So, you know, there's nothing new in heaven and earth, as they say. Now, during some of that abreaction-type research with MDMA, a side effect was noted that it produced a euphoria and it had quite a high potential for recreational use. And we know the story. It happens with drugs all the time. There was a drug that was being developed by Pfizer for heart disease, which had a, had a side effect that was noted in the trial, and we call it Viagra. In some ways, this is a similar story. Now, PTSD is, is interesting because the drugs don't work. And that's the bottom line. As it happens, I chaired the uh, national PTSD guidelines over here. And what was really stark was that there was reasonably good evidence around a couple of sorts of psychological therapies. But there was very, very weak evidence around a couple of drugs being sort of beneficial as an adjunct, but certainly not treatments for PTSD. And indeed, some of the drugs that are still commonly prescribed in the US are dangerous. They massively increase the risk of a person taking their own life, etc. So what we have currently in the standard of care for for post-traumatic stress disorder is expensive, long courses of psychological therapies. We're talking about trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy, which is probably the best evidence of all, and maybe eight sessions, so quite, quite a long course. Now, what the early trials have shown in veterans with a long history of PTSD that has been resistant to all standard treatments is almost a miraculous response potentially a curative response from only a couple of sessions. And that is immensely exciting, you know, partly because it's treating people who were untreatable and doing that successfully, partly because it's shortening and bringing into focus the nature of, of treatment, and partly because we've got some indication on some pharmacology that can actually be helpful you know, in this very difficult condition. And, you know, just to flag something about PTSD, when people hear PTSD, they think, you know, shell shock in the war or something. It's not only military personnel and veterans who have PTSD. It's not only military personnel and first responders. It's people who've had crimes uh, committed against them. It's all sorts of people you know, in broader society. Even people who have witnessed traumatizing events to others can be traumatized by them. And I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but last time I looked, it was about 10 times what I thought it could possibly be. 
uh, you know, the, the, the number of people with PTSD. This is a common and a debilitating condition. Potentially, we have treatments here that could be life changing from people affected. Yeah, thank you for that. That's really useful and good to understand the context around PTSD, because I do think that everyone does naturally assume it's of the very kind of extreme cases and and it's much more widespread than that. Jazz, to flip back to you, I mean, psilocybin is is probably, in my mind, the most talked about psychedelic that I see just from news and noise generally. And it seems like there's a lot of different companies who are studying it for treatment resistant depression. So I wonder who's going to win that race. But in terms of effectiveness, you know, what are some of the things that you're seeing around it? Does it work for everyone? What are some of the limitations around its efficacy that, that you're seeing in initial data? And I think it comes down to how we define work and the quality of the experience. So quality is important for clinical indications. So for example, in psychiatric treatment, other indications such as set and setting, the proper preparation and integration are crucial to enduring positive outcomes. Additionally, like we do see that self-reported data from study participants and psychedelic users, for example, like real-world evidence studies, describing enhanced creativity, creative thought process, feelings of introspection, spiritual experiences, increased positive mood, can still be considered successful experiences and outcomes because they're contributing to quality of life. And I think that even as we go and design clinical trials for for clients, these are things that we have to always have as consideration. So, and it's very unique for us and it's an interesting challenge because defining how does it work can look at that set and setting is so important to us. So to Mitchell's point before is we still don't know what's the appropriate setting. Is it a very fancy, luxurious kind of mental health clinic with couches and serenity, or is it a very clinical hospital setting? We definitely know it's not the very clinical hospital setting, but that happy medium. Sort of on the the other side of this too is, you know, there's companies that have developed genetic testing to essentially help profile whether or not you'll have a a successful, not experience, but just how well you'd react on more of a of a chemical level to some of these compounds, which I think is a great addition to companies or to clients or to clinics that want to see how they'll respond. But to everything, we're still very early. It's tough to see how it works. We know it doesn't work for everybody. Just like any other pharmaceutical compound, it won't work in at least 30% of the population. So I do think we need to keep that in consideration from the very beginning. It can't be viewed as a miracle drug for everybody. I think that's really what it comes down to. We have to be very pragmatic that it's still an investigational compound. The real world evidence data is going to be very beneficial, but from a clinical setting and a clinical trial perspective, we are still very early on in the game and looking still at very isolated conditions and very small populations. Yeah, it's not dissimilar to cannabis in that way, is it? There's, There's some people who'd like to think it cures everything, but perhaps not. Okay, so Mitchell, you know, as these guys have talked about, and particularly when it comes to MDMA for PTSD, I think this question is more relevant, but, you know, classic business cases for pharmaceutical medicine is effectively repeat business, right? Something that someone will need to take repeatedly. If the initial promising research is showing that perhaps you may only need a few doses to last you an extended period of time, does that, in your mind, affect the business case for those sort of drugs? Yes, absolutely. So let me just tell all the listeners that you're not likely to hear more pragmatic, sensible, and intelligent comments than what we're hearing from Steve and Jazz right here. So being somebody who's typically on the other side with the psychonauts and the investors and so on, you know, we need this dose of reality and all the listeners That's are why going, I brought you guys together. <laughs> well, I'm learning a lot I'm learning a lot too, so I'm in, so I'm impressed. So it's hard to answer that question on a non-ideological basis. And and I don't look at big pharma as big evil. I think this industry will go the pharmaceutical route. We won't change the system because of psychedelics. We'll have to learn to work within that. Having said that, it's just like Jazz said, we don't know yet. Now, if one or two macro doses, as Steve suggested, will do it, then that's what will come out. I don't believe there's a mass conspiracy of pharmaceutical companies to prevent treatments. Full stop. I know it because I worked in the pharmaceutical sector. This, the potential here, and Steve talked about it, how many people suffer from PTSD. I spend a lot of time in Rwanda in the last year. That's a country suffering from PTSD. 
because of their genocide in 1993, 94. So I don't think there's going to be any lack of a market for this. The question will be, coming back to what Jazz said, will it be accessible? Will it be reimbursed? Having said all of that, to me, the two bigger issues is when and how. And what seems to to irk me to no end in this industry with a lot of the, the boosters or the psychonauts or the real you know supporters is that they don't understand some basic things. One is, Jazz talked about this, the mechanics of reimbursement. Everyone's targeted in the United States to launch these drugs. And until you, you know, you reduce the stigma, you get continuing medical education for physicians, you get their regulatory bodies to approve it, you get insurance, like it's going to take a long time. So being able to say, you know, how big is the market? You have to really make some educated guesses about when that market will come and how quickly these products will be or these compounds will be prescribed. Because we know in a lot of cases, they won't be first or second run treatments. They'll come third and fourth. And finally around that is to what Jazz said is what is it going to cost and what is it going to cost relative to the alternatives? And that's always a fundamental question. Being in Canada where we have public health care and you have to get a product listed on a provincial formulary, our health economists, certainly where I am in Ontario, will weigh those benefits and those costs relative to everything else. We don't have everything listed in our provincial formulary, which means our government pays for it. So until you get that last mile, could be a last thousand miles as far as a lot of drug companies and service providers. So really, until we get to that moment where we have all the clinical data, we have all the cost, we know exactly how we're going to dose. We know the ethics around this. We have a proper educational profile and protocol for physician, we won't really know that. But I don't think all these big actors and these dark forces are conspiring to prevent these treatments from getting to market. Yeah, very interesting feedback. I mean, maybe it will initiate a slight paradigm shift in that, you know, if it's a shorter course of treatment, let's say, but the population sizes we're talking about are very big and affect, you know, virtually every population to a very appreciable degree, maybe that will just sort of slightly change the way that it's approached because the prize is still very big if you're looking at it from a purely financial perspective. And who knows, it may stimulate more education around this area. More people might want to be trained to be able to become a therapist in this space, etc. Steve, you're waving your hand at me. We've talked about this before, but I actually wanted, was going to come to you because what we talked about before is you were talking a bit about why the US is a special case in terms of it might be difficult to crack. That's exactly where I, where I was going to go. Yeah, I can see you know exactly what what we've just been saying. You know, applying fairly simply in the UK, in Canada, in Spain, and actually in lots of Europe, Australia for that matter, because it's going to be a function of you know either the relative cost effectiveness or the relative cost burden of the treatment versus a standard of care treatment that in most countries is fairly well established and fairly well evidence-based. The US is a slightly different case. You know, for fear of hordes of American psychiatrists chasing me with pitchforks, I think in mental health is slightly odd there, partly because people have insurance through their employer often, and they don't necessarily want to declare mental ill health. So there's a lot of self-management or out-of-pocket payment bypassing insurance for care. And of course, when you're contracting with a doctor directly and not through an insurance company, the insurance company doesn't have oversight of the appropriateness of of care. And we look at some of the really good stuff that we know works really well in the rest of the world, like cognitive behavior therapy and depression and anxiety, for example. And it's much less widespread in the US than it is in just about every other market. And yet we pretty much know that it's of what we've got out there at the moment, the best there is. So there's clearly something else unusual about the US market and the way mental health service providers are delivering their care. So it might well be just because we think that the US is is the right market for most drugs, it might well be that it could be exactly the wrong market for psychedelics right now. Because if nothing else, the community of psychiatrists don't want to stop doing the weekly wallet biopsy on their patients. <laughs> yes, thank you, Steve. That's a great way to describe it as well. And Mitchell, you're waving your hand now as well. Please 
picture. Yeah, Steve is 100% correct. I certainly don't want to suggest it's the best place to deploy these compounds and services. In fact, he's 100% correct. It's not. But it's the largest price. And if you crack the U.S. and you get FDA approvals, which is where most companies are going, you know, literally, it's the place to conquer first unlike you know other places that might be better from a treatment perspective. So this is where there's potentially a misalignment between what's better ultimately for patients and what's better for businesses and IP lawyers and so on and so forth who are sort of like sharks circling the psychedelics industry looking for fees and looking to make a lot of money. And just to add one caveat to what I said, there is one institution in the U.S., which functions differently. There's more than one, but there's one in particular, and that's the VA, the Veterans Administration. So there is opportunity because it, it is much more evidence-based in the way it's practiced, in the way mental health care is practiced, because it, in effect it has a single controlling mind as an organization. There is opportunity for psychedelics to become part of the standard of care through the VA. And maybe that's the sort of Trojan horse route into the rest of the US uh, health economy. Yeah, and Jess, would you like to? Uh, To kind of touch on both points there. So first to the VA system in the US. So the VA has independently been running clinical trials in ketamine and psilocybin for years, as well as more recently MDMA and LSD is coming down the pipeline. And so to Steve's point, it is sort of the, the where you want to go. To Mitchell's point, it's the biggest market. We all know this is the biggest healthcare market in the world. That is sort of the, the golden ticket. Very difficult to crack. But when we look realistically at pathways to the US for both cannabis and psychedelics, it's still not a very well-defined regulatory pathway, so which makes it difficult. So for clients of ours, the US is typically the last area we go. It is the last regulatory hurdle or jurisdiction that we do enter. There are pathways, but again, similar to uh, the ILAP program in the United Kingdom and rolling submission in by Health Canada, the US has FDA breakthrough therapy, which MAPS was able to achieve. But again, it is a very difficult use case justification. But if you have the data and evidence, you can certainly go that route too. But I think the key component here, and we've all talked about it, is to get these drugs to market and to do reimbursement, you are acting as a pharmaceutical company. And I think that there has to be that sense of realization that that's who you are. And there's nothing negative about being a pharma company. You are a biotechnology company investing in developing a new investigational product. But if you want to lobby mental health associations, if you want to lobby insurance companies, state boards, medical associations, the key differentiator here is you need a lot of money and you need a very structured team to pull that off for you. And I think that's the critical component here is that the budgeting associated with with getting drugs to market. You can certainly have your drugs available. And I say drugs in terms of like pharmaceuticals available on the market. They can be available, but there's a lot of planning. That's why the standard euphemism was it takes a billion dollars in 10 years to get a drug to market because there's so many things happening in the background outside of clinical trials, outside of regulatory and manufacturing. It is a time and the the work that goes into actually getting that drug to market making sure that label is proper, making sure you have the right key opinion leaders and physicians working with you to push the drug forward in terms of lobbying efforts, if you will. And I think that's something that a lot of these companies do need to realize. If you're willing to take that battle, you can certainly do it if you want to take it all the way, or you consider dropping off at like phase two after you get phase two data and potentially selling your molecule, which is also a very smart thing to do. There's a lot of smaller biotech companies that did that. That's how we got the mRNA vaccine was, you know, the larger companies buying up small molecules from smaller biotech companies, primarily Canadian. (laughs) But, you know, there's some considerations in the planning process for these companies about where they want to move forward and how they want to do that. Yeah, I think you mentioned the L word, which is one that I was going to mention, which is lobbying and you know, not to say that this doesn't happen all over the world, but the US is definitely <laughs> probably the world leader in corporate lobbying and in terms of, you know, existing industries protecting themselves against potential threats in, in whatever way you want to see that. So a really interest that's a really interesting section to reflect on all of those moving parts. As we sort of come towards the end, it would be remiss to not mention a very popular Silicon Valley kind of generated area that crosses this which is microdosing 
you know, you've got lots of Elon Musk, Tim Ferriss type characters who are waxing lyrical about it. But from every doctor I speak to, as well as the studies that I've read around this, it doesn't seem that it's more effective than placebo, really. Jazz, would you, what's your view on this in terms of this area of wellness? Well, to your point, it's it's certainly very popular, but I think the current issue or the issue with current microdosing studies is that there's a lack of placebo groups. So if we study the current evidence that we have, that's the one thing that really strikes is that lack of those placebo groups. And there was a recent meta-analysis, which is a, essentially a large summary of a number of data sets and a number of studies. And it looked at different microdosing or microdoses, both LSD and psilocybin across different studies and found that while smaller doses were like more efficacious to an extent, the therapeutic uh, efficacy increased exponentially. But it brings up the question of is if less is less, why not go for more? And it ultimately boils down to the desires and the intentions behind the consumption. Is it for therapeutic purposes? Is it for driving creativity, promoting expansion of ideas and thoughts, which is typically what the Silicon Valley types are hoping to pursue? Or is it for a specific medical indication? So is it for ADHD? Is it for major depressive order, for example? So I think it's the literature does and doesn't support it. It's still out there. And I think probably Steve has some better, more clinical explanation. But I say it's popular, but it comes down to why do you want to do it? Yeah, if I come in, I guess a couple of things. I agree absolutely with everything Jas has said. You know, the evidence is that more is more, so do more. Makes a lot of sense. I'm also mindful that, how can I put this? Claims have been made about increased creativity from every drug, from absinthe through to amphetamines and beyond. And when they've actually been studied, none of them have come to anything. And this is a century or more of it opens my mind and makes my art and creativity better being unproven. So I'm going to be a little bit skeptical at this point, you know, and say, actually, this is something, this is something that needs to be proven. It needs to be proven hard. And by going down this road, by making the claims around creativity and all that sort of thing, what we're actually doing is we're diluting the really important clinical use case in treating mental ill health. And that's where our obligation has to sit, you know, in healing the sick, not in pandering to the narcissistic. (laughs) Yes, I mean, I totally agree. I, I love the idea of it from a wider perspective, but if it's hampering and effectively undermining the kind of really serious stuff, then that's not great. I mean, Mitchell, you know, you you speak to loads of these companies. You've been to a few of these conferences. I've not been to a psychedelics conference yet, but I've certainly seen a couple of companies that are sort of almost trying to make this a recreational slash wellness play, which seems very premature, if I'm honest. But what are you seeing around this, you know, with or without reference to microdosing? Well, I'm I'm upset that my hopes are on absinthe. I'm a big Balzac fan. (laughs) (laughs) I figured it'll work for him and it'll work for me. But moving beyond 19th century French literature, I agree with everything Jazz and Steve said, but notwithstanding that, there are industries that are growing around this, around the perception these things work. I mean, nootropics and functional mushrooms in the United States is a large CPG-based industry. Do the products work? No, they don't. You know, there's a lot of miscommunication, bad marketing. Yes, yes, yes. But it is an industry around the guise of, you know, cognitive boosting, memory boosting, creative, like, yeah, it's sham science without a doubt, but it's legal, quasi-legal anyway, and it's growing like crazy. So do I see these kinds of categories emerging? Absolutely. They're already there right now. There is a very vibrant quasi-legal industry in these things in the illicit markets. So much like cannabis was, psychedelics, we're already there. And they're going to be pushing, companies are going to be pushing the envelopes on making claims and saying things that are borderline what we just spoke about with microdosing and so on. They will continue to do that until the FDA or Health Canada, where we are, clamp down. And right now, no one's clamping down on anything. So when I talk about psychedelics, it's not only the biotech and the medical side, there's also the non-research-based psychedelics industry, and that's growing like gangbusters, even in Europe as well. There's a, a, a company called Red Light Holland. That's a publicly listed company in Canada that is doing that in Holland right now. So I foresee the continued growth 
of this new tropics functional mushroom cognitive boosting market to the point where, like Jazz said, it becomes sort of a wellness product. Will it do anything? No, absolutely not. But at the end of the day, there'll be a lot of people working for these companies and they'll have hundreds of products in market. Yeah, it's a bit like my CBD pillow spray. I'm not sure whether that really helps me. Uh, (laughs) So just to keep on this theme, Steve, I might get your take on it as well. I mean, given this sort of recreational slash plant background to some of these psychedelic drugs, particularly mushrooms, obviously, which grow wild, does this pose any kind of problems to the defensibility of IP in this space? I mean, if your IP can't be protected or monopolized, you know, does this disincentivize research investment? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not an IP lawyer, and I think there are other people here who know far more about that, this than I do. I mean, to my, in my view, it's not the recreational status or the potential for recreational use that's necessarily the issue. It's the fact that it's very, very difficult to get IP on a naturally occurring substance. You know, you can get process IP on you know extraction or, or or synthesis, but that's actually quite hard to defend. You can get usage IP around a particular indication, and I but my personal view is in the longer term that's impossible to defend, and we will be seeing that in the cannabis space over the next four or five years when. GW Farmers products, you know, in effect, get challenged by cheaper alternatives. And so it it starts getting very difficult. What can you actually protect? And it's another reason why the conversation about psychotherapy actually adds value from a business point of view, as well as a clinical point of view, because what you can do, you know, okay, you can produce a new molecular entity, but so can everyone else. But what you can do is you can get the therapy thing right and have approval for exactly that structure of therapy. And that gives you at least something you can trade from. Yeah, very useful. Thank you. So look, as we we, we come right to the end now, where is most of the investment going in this space? You know, it's kind of an open question. Is it in research or jazz? I'm going to look at you. We certainly see a lot of money going towards clinical trials. It's one of the things that we certainly do help our clients with as well is kind of planning. So preparing budgets to do phase one, phase two clinical trials, and then sort of that runway through to phase three. And we do work with a lot of investment companies as well. So both private equity, some venture, and then private equity hedge funds too, to kind of look at that runway to investments in molecules or sort of predicting what would be successful outcomes post phase two. And, you know, to Mitchell's point to what he was saying previously, like it's a mixed bit of a a bag right now. There we have the very purely biotech focus, which is for clinical trials, investments in that. Then you have companies that look at the clinical model and want to build, you know, clinics like Field Trip, for example. And then, you know, there's the wellness space too that I know is also getting a lot of money. But from my specific area, we do see a lot of activity and generation for clinical trials. Just Jazz, while you're well with you, given that you also work in the cannabis space, are you seeing more people going down this route earlier than they have done in the cannabis sector? I think there's a lot of a number of groups that have had lessons learned from the cannabis industry that have spilled over into psychedelics where some of those harsh realities of how to build a viable business in this particular industry that you and I always say this to people and I, I know I'm burst a lot of bubbles when I say this too. It's like you need to pick a lane. Are you a biotech or pharmaceutical company? Are you in the wellness space or are you in sort of the commercial retail infrastructure build of a particular group or industry? And you need to pick that. If you don't pick a lane and if you try to do everything, it will not be very successful. And again, with psychedelics, if you are a psychedelic company looking to take a drug to market, you have to start thinking like a pharmaceutical company from the very beginning and very strategically understand where your money and your assets need to go and the jurisdictions that you want to eventually take your drug to market. So not what's the easiest place to run a study, but it's where do you eventually want to commercialize your drug? It needs to be decided fairly early on so that even your clinical trials are designed in a specific way, that lobbying sort of the key critical stakeholders you have in place are put in place early and you can understand the market and then understand how much money you need to eventually raise to get you to market. And with that comes your expected sort of target revenues and valuations with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mitchell, you wanted to add something. Yeah, how difficult it was to follow Steve now to follow Jazz, but um, I can with more harsh realities. If you look at any of the public companies, their valuations are down anywhere from, say, 60 to 90 percent. 
there's not a lot of money going into new certainly if you've got an mdma or a psilocybin company now forget it you're not going to be funded there's a traffic jam steve talked about this right there's a traffic jam of research and compounds you know that train has absolutely left the station i like other like sort of second tier psychedelic compounds like 2cb that have unbelievable prom promise they're, they're synthetic but the challenge there is that a lot of the early stage money has gone to the larger players like a tie and compass and so on. And I think a lot of savvy investors are doubling down on those investments per Jazz's point, because you have a much higher chance of success on companies that are much farther down the pipeline. So the challenge is, is that I think the markets are depending now on a home run or a triple, and they've pulled back because the money is just not there. And we've seen that in, in cannabis, even though cannabis continues to grow in revenues substantially in every legal market. But really, the, the psychedelic industry needs some really, really good news or more good news right now. And until it gets that, the valuations won't be there. And if the valuations aren't there, you're not going to get the early stage money you need to research 2CB and some of these other business models and so on. Yeah, absolutely. And Steve, did you have anything to add on that at all? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can follow that. Actually, I think Mitchell is absolutely right. You know, there was the early movers uh, advantage, and that still plays, but it's getting harder and harder. And I struggle to see where the sort of physical compound, the chemical compound uh, business model actually is. I mean, I think this is an issue in healthcare more broadly. Anyway, if you look at where revenue growth is. It's in healthcare services. It's not in, you know, medical devices or pharma or pharmaceutical compounds. Often, so maybe that maybe this is just uh, the psychedelics industry picking up a broader secular trend within the industry. But either way, I'm struggling to see the wisdom in new businesses entering the market doing the same as uh, current market incumbents uh, are doing. Now, if you know, if someone turns around tomorrow and they've got a a chemosynthesis for psilocybin, you know, a one-stage chemosynthesis, so they can produce it in massive volumes, then that's a different story. But that's going to disrupt the, the, the whole market. And those things don't happen very often. And Jess, did you want to add something to that? Maybe just to kind of round out that point, to Mitchell's point about the psychedelics market is looking for a home run. I think if there's patients involved, like we're getting there, the MDMA studies in phase three, so that's going to be a home run pretty soon, uh, in at least in at least finishing a study like at that time. But if we look at the cannabis industry with any indication of the biggest deals that have ever happened in the last year, the biggest cannabis deals to have ever occurred, both occurred in the pharmaceutical space with Pfizer buying Arena Pharmaceuticals for over $7 billion and Jazz Pharmaceuticals buying GW Pharma for 6.7 or something that completely eclipsed any form of like infrastructure or recreational deal that ever happened, you know, to the extent that they're moving forward. And these are major players coming in that recognized the work that went, the clinical work that went into compound development and clinical trial results to take that drug even further or to keep using that drug. And so I think that there is a light at the end of the shining tunnel. I think this is an incredibly fascinating space. And to Steve's point that he made previously, we do have a duty of care to our patients. So, you know, I'm a clinician just like Steve, and we do look at this from a very focused, you know, microscopic view too. Like we still need to take care of our patients. We're in this to conduct these clinical trials, design them, consult with clients, because we still understand both sides of the field, what clinicians are looking for when they prescribe these drugs and these pharmaceuticals eventually. But also, what is it? How do we disseminate this knowledge from these kind of popularized communities? So, veterans, first responders, how do we actually make it available to everybody? You know, to Mitchell's point, how do you heal an entire nation like Rwanda that all suffers from PTSD for being war torn? So, there's also that duty to say that when we conduct this work, we do need to be applying that knowledge translation to be able to disseminate it to everybody, which also includes that accessibility to the drug and the cost of that drug once you actually get to market. If you keep clinics private and say, oh, that's fine, I'll own a private clinic in the US that's not under an insurance, that's not accessible. That's accessible to maybe 5% of the population, certainly not to a lot of veterans. 
Everybody can't go to a retreat. I think retreats are great if they're conducted under medical supervision and that have all that in place. But again, we still need to find and develop therapies that are can be made for everybody. Yeah, there's a real cost factor, isn't there? Cost and time. And, you know, just I think in the UK, and just totally to draw an analogy, GPs are spending less and less time with patients and it is a kind of get you in and out as quick as possible. And that's a function of constraints on the system. But, you know, not sure if that's necessarily getting the best results because people are just getting prescribed something they can get quickly. And, and maybe that's not the name of the game here. It seems very apparent from everything we've talked about, just how important the the wraparound therapy is. So. Steve, you're looking like you wanted to... Yeah, I I was going to add that there are also all sorts of other constraints that are put in there that we're not necessarily aware of. So when you get a new breakthrough therapy that on paper may be cheaper and more effective than the existing therapies, what you end up doing is, is absorbing lots of what economists call unmet need. So actually, you get a big balloon of cost. This is what happened with, I go back to Viagra. At the time when that came out, there were no satisfactory treatments. And maybe 1% of the people who could benefit from uh, Viagra were, were having the other treatments. The other 99% were getting nothing. So suddenly there was a mass of additional cost. And it's ex- going to be exactly the same in PTSD, where services have set severity thresholds really, really high in order to ration the, the scarce resource of their therapy staff. Well, guess what? You know, when, when we only need a quarter of the number of sessions, for argument's sake, we're not going to have four times the number of cases because the staff cost is still there, et cetera. We're going to get an expansion in cost because of meeting unmet need. Does, does that make sense at all? Absolutely. It's a Pandora's box, isn't it? Who knows what's going to come out as, as a consequence. Guys, I'm going to bring this to an end now because, I mean, literally, it's just, we could continue talking for ages. This has been super interesting. But I'd like to thank you all for your time. And I'm sure it's going to be really useful for the listeners. So Jazz, Steve, Mitchell, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Nuj. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe, rate, review and share the podcast. It will help me spread the good word on how this amazing industry is developing. I work with various cannabis startups to help them get funded and grow. I also work with corporates and international cannabis companies to help them understand and navigate the European cannabis sector. We're working with some great clients across the cannabis value chain and we'd love to help you too. Please visit www.canverse.global to get in touch.